I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for tuning in on this one, the next installment of what has become Quinlan's Corner. Every time you say it. It hurts. It hurts. It doesn't feel good to say, but uh, I don't know. We got Preston to thank for that one. Yeah, thanks, Preston. Yeah. Well, we uh, we hope you're enjoying this ballistic study, guys, because this has been something that you know we've we've got some information that we've laid out that we've wanted to put out. We just didn't really have the platform to do so. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's only so much you can do on Facebook or Instagram, and um, you know, so putting this information out in large scale and in you know, kind of a long form has been been pretty awesome. And so we've really culminated up to this point, Jaden, where we've talked throughout the whole history of the study of ballistics and ballistic coefficient using BC calculators and their inherent deficiencies. And then what using drag coefficient based trajectory solutions will get you. And then how that has worked with Ford off. Mm-hmm. And we talked about what is different between Ford off and a BC based calculator. Mm-hmm. So on this podcast, what I want to do is outline for the listener and more so the viewer, we'll touch on that in a minute. How do you get the most out of Ford off? What are some of the, of the features and the setup that will allow the user to get better solutions and more first round impacts? What do we have to do to get that? So walk us through that. And I mentioned for the listener and then also the viewer guys out there for this one. I know we've mentioned it in the past. This is pretty visual aid intensive. Mm-hmm. So if you can watch this one on the Vimeo, on YouTube, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do a lot of things for you because you're going to see in real time uh, over in Quinlan's corner, him actually updating Ford off and selecting things and typing things. And uh, it's just going to be a lot easier for you if you can jump on there and watch it. Now we'll do our best to try to make this, you know, audio friendly as well. Um, but, you know, if you're listening to it in the audio format and you're driving down the road, uh, maybe when you get a chance, jump on YouTube and go back and watch some of the things that you missed. Yeah. So with that, Jaden, you you go to your cell phone, your tablet, whatever you got, mm-hmm. and you search the App Store or Google Play for Hornady Ford off. Mm-hmm. You download it; it's free of charge. You set up a profile. So walk us through one why we want to create a profile, and then let's talk about what's the next step. Yeah. The first thing when you download the app, um, when you open it up, you're going to be presented with a login screen. And the purpose for that is when you create a login, um, everything that you do in that app is going to be tied to that login account and saved into the cloud, essentially, whatever that is. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. But what it means is that any profiles you build, any results that you save, any, not like the use of the app, like what ranges you set or whatever, but things you save in the app, the yeah. favorite files, the results, those are tied to that email login. So if you, you know, your phone dies, uh, battery goes dead. I can take your phone that has the Ford off app downloaded on it, log in to that app, and all that stuff comes to that phone. Or Perfect. my phone breaks. Or uh, the other reason we did it was for like instructors that are out there. Um, if you have a, you know, a couple different loaner rifles that you give out to students, or if you're military law enforcement, same thing, right? You have department or unit unit rifles. Um, you can have those rifles pre built in to the program, and then with one email. You can log in with that same email under multiple devices. It's not like when you log in in one, it logs you out on another one. Perfect. From from that perspective, from an instructor standpoint, uh, it gives you one source of input to make sure all the outputs are correct and identical across multiple devices. And that's been pretty handy for, for yeah. people. Yeah, <clears throat> awesome. So before we get into the Ford off and setting up a profile, on the last podcast, we touched on the BC base calculator and the ammo library. Mm-hmm. So those features are there. They're in the app. You'll see them. If you want more information on them, go back and listen to the previous Ford off podcast. Um, and they're there for you. But this one specifically is just about Ford off because that is the whole purpose of the app yeah. is make this thing more accurate than what was previously existing and to get you more first round impact. So now. Yep. So what we've got here on the screen, um, after you log into the app, this is the the first screen you're going to see the home screen there's a video up top that helps you you know if you if you listen to this podcast or you've never used the app and you've got it downloaded and and you don't get around to it right away well all of that stuff is fresh in your mind and two months from now you're like oh how how did i do this or that that's what that video is for um down below that's your selection for 
either Ford off or BC side, like we said, we'll concentrate on the Ford off side. Um, but the BC side has every bullet that we make, V maxes, spire points, all that stuff is in that side where Ford off only has the long range applicable stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, again, you mentioned the ammo library. If we scroll down on that home screen, ammo library, like you said, that's all BC based, but it preloads the velocity and picture BC info and all that from the ammo that you select. Mm-hmm. Help and support. Um, obviously, that's self explanatory. And then Hornady on the web. So that's that home screen. But what we'll do is we'll go into the Ford off uh, option here. You're going to be presented with a screen that says favorites and general calculator. Now, the reason that we have that is the general calculator is for you just kind of want to go in and check something real quick. You don't want to go through setting up the favorite and, and you know, all the time that it takes to do that. You're okay. at the range and the guy next to you isn't using Ford off and he's not hitting his target and he's wondering why you can quickly say, Hey, well, tell me your quick information real quick, dump it in and be like, yeah, here, here's your solution. That's okay. kind of the purpose. Or you just want to acid check. What we're going to do, go through the favorite process. Okay. Now in, if you, you know, accidentally use general calculator, set all your stuff up in there and we're using it and you're like, Oh man, I, it's, I wanted the favorite and I accidentally hit general. When you exit out of the heads up display on general calculator, it'll ask you if you want to save it as a favorite. Okay. So even if you accidentally end up in general, you want it to be in favorites, it's it's really of no consequence. Okay. So we go to favorites. If you've never used the app, this is the first screen you'll see. It pretty much says, hey, you don't have a favorite, so let's create one. Yep. Um, so you can hit this center button. Or the top right, there will always be a plus sign, and that's how you create them in the future after you've, you've okay. created your first one. You hit that, it's going to give you the option to create a BC favorite or a Ford off favorite. We give that option just because if you accidentally entered the bc side and you wanted to be on the ford off side this is just kind of a, a last minute you hey know. yeah take a look here see make sure you're doing what you want that's right okay so we're going to create a ford off file then it's going to pull up what is the the initial favorites page so up in the top here this change image has a generic picture of a long range rifle um you can click that and when you do you could take a photo so this is if you want to organize your favorite files with pictures based on your your rifles you can take a photo, you can pick one from your library, or you can just leave that generic image if you want. Yeah. Um, the next one is the title block here. The title block is required. So this is how um, essentially the name of your favorite gets stored. Yep. So the title, you can name it anything you want. Mm-hmm. Um, the title is going to be visible when we go to the HUD. So this helps you to make sure that you're using the right system. You right. didn't acci- accidentally pick the wrong rifle. Yep. That's been really handy. I've named those, you know, anything from like, early on my 308 winchester was named jenny so i had them there but or you could get really specific where like i was just on a hunt with my dad and i had a file for dad's seven millimeter prc so Mm -hmm. there was no question about what profile you were in right one thing i like to do especially if i have a a rifle that i shoot multiple different bullets or loads in Mm -hmm. is i start i make sure that that's that's in the title block because again when you're on the hud you're going to have that title presented to you and so then i can see what load yeah. I'm actually shooting. What so bullet I'm, or load or suppressed yeah, or so unsuppressed. It might say, you know, 6.5, uh, whatever. And you know, we'll just do podcast and we'll say 140. Okay. You know, something like along the lines of that. Next two fields below that. Rifle and optic. Those are not required fields, but you can certainly fill those out. Um, and where those will show up is after you've created a bunch of favorites and we'll go back to the favorite screen that shows the, the ability to select them. That's where that info shows itself. Okay. So you can organize it that way, but on the HUD, the heads up display where you're actually using the app to get a ballistic solution, you're not going to see the rifle and the optics fields. They're not presented to you there. Okay. But again, those two aren't mandatory. We'll just leave them off for right now. Uh, your next one down is your, is your bullet, your bullet library. This so you, is the big one. This is the big one. So you select that. And you can immediately start to scroll and the Hornady bullets are up top. And if you keep on scrolling, you'll get down to, you know, all, all the other bullets that are yeah. in there, Sierra, Lapua, Burgers, all that stuff. Um, an easy way to get what you're looking for, because I've had this happen many times where somebody calls me, Hey, this bullet's not in the library and you scroll yeah. down and it's like, it is, it's just, you know, it's easy to overlook stuff in a list. Yep. You can do filter up here in the top, right. And you can break it down by essentially caliber. So we want to go to six, five. It's only going to show us all the six five bullets from, from all manufacturers. manufacturers, right? Hornady's at the top. Scroll down. There's the Burgers, Lapua's, Nosler's, Sierra's. All those are in there. So if we wanted to, we named our file 140. Let's say we're shooting the 140 ELD match. So we'll pick that bullet. And once we pick that, if you remember the last podcast where we differentiated um, 
BC calculators and how they only know like one or two or maybe three things about your bullet. And then when you pick a Ford off bullet library bullet, there's 437 things. That's what just happened when we picked that. Yeah. So now all that information, yeah. all, all that. the tables, the coefficients, all the moments, yep. 437 unique points to that individual bullet are now, they're now in. selected. Okay. Yep. And this is, uh, this is, uh, as I go through this, these I'll, I'll bring up points to check when you have a problem, this would be a point to check. Uh, so what I mean by that is you build your file, you go out to shoot and you're like, man, I'm off by like two mils or something crazy, right? Like four minutes or whatever it is, like a crazy amount of error. One of the things that could be the source of that is you picked the wrong bullet. So as an acid check, when you're trying to, to solve a problem, um, come back, make sure you have the right bullet selected. Sure. The next one below that is set load info. So let's go into that. Yeah. Not required. Not required. So up at the top, you see a table. Uh, it says. Uh, Custom with a little toggle below that is case, primer, cartridge overall length, charge weight, and powders. So what this is, is essentially just a record box where you can, you know, if you're a reloader or a hand loader and you have your own recipe, you can record all that stuff in here. That's saved me many times. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm in a hurry. I develop a load for a hunt and uh, it worked great. And then, oh, hey, there's an NRL hunter match that I'm going to end up shooting and I have enough of that loaded up. Oh, what was it? Or I didn't have enough, you know, yeah, I need but to load I a little bit more. It. Right. Yeah. So it, it's nice to have that record keeping. Um, case primer, cartridge over our length and bullet weight are just entry fields, but this powders down here, there's, there's more to it. You see the little arrow sitting there. If we hit powders, it's going to bring up a huge table of many of the commercially available long range applicable propellants that we see used. Sure. What this table is comprised of is temperature sensitivity data that we've tested in the lab. I mean, you've, you've done that stuff with me. Yep. You know, we test at negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit and plus uh, either 125 or 140, and then at ambient at 70. And what we do is we figure out how much change in velocity is correlated to the change in temperature of the ammunition. Uh, a temperature sensitivity factor is generated from that. It's a it's a uh, amount of feet per second change per degree change, right? So a uh, uh, temperature sensitivity factor of one means that for every degree change in Fahrenheit, your velocity is going to change by one foot per second. So when you pick these, uh, we'll just pick one. You know, let's let's do the old standby H forty three fifty. We yep. used to print it on the label, right? Yep. So when we, we select that H4350, you see it loaded a 0.73. So what that means is uh, that H4350 in, in the average result of all of the different testing, because we don't just test it once out of one cartridge. We test that out all kinds of different stuff. Different bore diameters, different case sizes. Mm -hmm, primers, yeah. uh, all that. And all of that will have an influence on your temperature sensitivity factor. So, But you see it loaded a 0 0.73. So that means that it's going to change 0.7 feet per second per degree Fahrenheit. Right. And a big note here, and you probably will touch on it, that's 0.73 uh, feet per second per degree from your baseline test temperature. Exactly. That's important. Which is that input right above there. Yep. Yes. So um, when you when you set this up, if you're going to use the temperature sensitivity factor, you need to tell it the temperature at which you, me you measured your muzzle velocity, because it's going to use that as a baseline to correct the velocity that you're going to have uh, based on the ambient air temperature. Right. Now, the way that works is within the app here a little bit later when we put in the environmental um, data, what it's going to do is we, t we tell it our baseline temperature is 70. So we went out, we zeroed our rifle, we shot our load. It was 70 degrees out. The ammo temperature was 70 degrees. Um, and so we set it up this way. Now we go out, it's 20 degrees out. That's 50 degrees cooler. So what it's going to do is take that 50 degree change in temperature from our baseline that's here to what we're actually shooting in and update the velocity based on that. So that's how that's working. Mm -hmm. Now, another point to make real quick, if we go back in, back into that table of powders, if your powder is not in there, um, you can go down to the very bottom where it says other. And if you select that, you can enter the name of a powder and then your own um, temperature sensitivity factor. Yep. And honestly, for the, the best results, you should test this yourself. You should not rely on the table we've built. Because again, it's based on an average of a whole bunch of different stuff. Your unique circumstance and load will have a, a slightly different one probably than the average. So you should test it. The way you test it is to test your muzzle velocity when your ammo is really cold and really hot and kind of an ambient and generate your you own know, table. Right. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort to do so. Most, most folks in the long range game have access to a really accurate chronograph, mm -hmm. a lab radar, magneto speed. 
you need a, a thermometer, temperature gun, a cooler, mm-hmm. and and the heater in your truck, basically. Yeah. And uh, and you can accurately do that. And I think another important note, we'll have a separate podcast on this entirely, but shoot a large enough sample size that your num- numbers are even remotely close to valid. Right. So don't shoot three, five, even 10. You know, I would encourage people to shoot 20 or 30 shots to get an average velocity. And if you're going to set up a table and you do it on a five shot sample of each temperature, you're not, you're not, you're not teaching yourself very much. You're not getting right. very much information. So yeah, uh, just a, a quick uh, tangent on that. Right. And like you said, this testing is pretty easy to do if you have a cooler or a heater. I like to do mine in the winter time here in Nebraska. It gets really cold. In the summertime, it gets pretty hot. Um, so you can use those times a year if you live in a climate like that to. Yeah, to sure, you can use that time of day. You could shoot in the morning, yeah. shoot in the afternoon, and shoot at night, and <laughs> you'll get right. You know, it'll be it'll go from seventy to thirty two yeah. in the same day, pretty pretty regularly. So yeah, you can do it on the same day. Yeah. Now, one more important thing is this little toggle here by ammunition temperature sensitivity. That's how you turn it on. So it has to show that to be active. Okay. You may not want to use it and you can just toggle it off, you know, but you may still want to record the powder that you're shooting, say. Yep. Um, so that's what that's for. Okay. So once we back out of there, that information will automatically save when you come out of there. So the next field down is your set rifle info. This is where you're going to put in all of your firearm related stuff. Yeah. This is super important that the, since the, history or the beginning of ballistic calculators, I'm sure somebody said, good data in, good data out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a, a borderline joke, but it's, it's true. It is incredibly true. Yeah. So the top one, very self-explanatory is muzzle velocity up here. Now, next to every single input uh, is this little red question mark thing. And if you tap that it, down at the bottom, it's going to pop up a description or some additional information. If you're not quite sure what that entry field means, um, same thing with the last page we were on with the uh, set load info. Those little question marks are there as well. So it's just okay. to help you as you're going through things. So muzzle velocity, self-explanatory. Here we see zero range, self-explanatory, right? We're all pretty familiar with that. We're going to come back to that in just a second for yes. the zero angle side. Mm-hmm. Um, sight height. So this is from the center line of the bore to the center line of the optic. An easy way to measure that is either you know pull your bolt back slightly in the rifle and measure from the center of the, of the lug. Mm-hmm. Yeah up to the the seam in the rings, right? The separation between the two rings and the yeah. and the scope rings, if you have that. But you're going center to center is what that measurement is. Okay. Um, you should be as accurate as possible with that. Uh, tape measure, mm, there's some there's some margin of error there. It'll work. Yeah. Uh, a, a caliper would be better if you can get away with that. Okay. Uh, next one down is barrel twist. So barrel twist is important for those dynamics, right? We Because the bullet's spinning. The bullet is spinning yeah. and we need to know how fast it's spinning to be able to figure out um, what the dynamics are going to be downrange, yeah. whether whether that's uh, spin drift, whether it's aerodynamic jump, whether it's uh, dynamic instability, all of those things that this calculator will calculate are tied to yeah. barrel twist. So make sure that that is the correct number. Right. Um, impact windage. So this would be uh, in the zero range setting. If you are biased in one direction, left or right, your zero is, you know, a half inch right in a no wind condition. Uh, this is where you could input that information. Yeah. Or I think that's really useful for the people that are still using the old school zero range. Mm. You'll find yourself within an adjustment. Like I can't move it a 10th of a mil to the right because that was going to favor me to the right. But mm-hmm. if I, I can't move it in between a 10th of a mil, mm-hmm. um, but I'm, you know, let's say 0.2 inches from being perfectly zeroed. Well, mm-hmm. the correction of a 10th of a mil is going to be 0.36. So uh, that's really handy to be able to account for that because if you're slightly biased, even though it's only a quarter of an inch, let's say, it will manifest itself somewhere. Yes. Uh, another place that that's commonly used is going suppressed to unsuppressed or vice versa. Mm-hmm. You might have, usually it's in the vertical direction, but you may observe some, some horizontal uh, shift in your point of impact. That's what that's for. Uh, for those listening, if you know, obviously, if you have the vertical impact, that's affecting zero range. So you would want to run two different zero ranges. Right. Bore diameter down here at the bottom. This one's not really a high maintenance field. Most people aren't going to have to even touch this. But if you are shooting some sort of a custom made barrel that has a non-standard bore diameter, that's where you would go into this field. So it's defaulted cur- currently based on the bullet we selected from the library. So that's that six five one forty. It's defaulted to the standard bore diameter that is found in 6.5. Mm. So if we go in there, 
We could hit other down here at the bottom if we had some, you know, crazy customized. Yeah. Uh, or some dimensions. people run tighter bores right. for enhanced accuracy. Right. Uh, so that's what that, that would be for. Okay. Uh, axial form factor here at the bottom. We're going to get to that here after we use the HUD a little bit. Okay. Um, but it is uh, available for editing in the set rifle page. Okay. So now that we've kind of gone through that whole thing, we're going to circle back up here to that zero range, zero angle entry. So you can see a toggle here for zero angle. If we toggle that over, it shows red, and then we get a box that pops up that says find zero angle. And if you remember from the last podcast, we kind of went into some more detail about what that is and, and why it happens, uh, why we use it. But we have to find our zero angle. We can't throw a protractor on the gun or, or your phone with the inclinometer and measure the angle. That's not finite enough. So what we have to do is find it. So once you toggle it over to zero angle, if you already know what your zero angle is because you've been using this for a while, you can just manually input that in. There, okay. There's no problem there. But if you have not found it yet, we're going we're gonna to select that button there, the find zero angle. That's going to take us to a page with quite a few inputs, but most of them were preloaded over from before. Right. So you see muzzle velocity. If, if I go back here and I change that to, let's say, 2700, something uh, more in line with, say, a 6.5 Creedmoor shooting a 140, when I go to find zero angle with that button, it pulled that over. Okay. So most of that, it's just an acid check, right? Is your muzzle, muzzle velocity that? Yes. Okay, continue. Zero target distance. This is the dis how far down range the target is that you're shooting yep. while, you're, while you're finding this. Yeah. And, and get as exact as you possibly can. That was a big one. I know a lot of like, oh, it's a hundred yard range. It's a hundred. Well, is it a hundred and one? Is right. it 99? Right. Are you measuring from the end of your muzzle? Are you measuring from the center of your scope? Um, and, you know, talking to the optics guys, the scope is assuming that your range is from the center of your scope. Mm -hmm. All adjustments uh, are made from there. Yep. So, uh, yeah, be as exacting as you possibly can with that. That's right. So we'll say we're at, let's say a hundred and four. Um, another thing to note is you have a couple different adjustment methods on all these. You can tap the red box on the right and just manually type it in. That's honestly what I do most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, for finite adjustment, the plus and minus signs allow you, you know, real fine adjustment. And then the slider bar allows you really gross adjustments, right? So it just, it, yeah. it's huge chunks. I prefer to just type in the exact number. Yep. Um, side height, let's say, you know, we'll say we're at 2.0. Six, yeah, it would have been pre-populated from the last screen. So yep. if we would have edited that there, um, there's your barrel twist entry, shooting angle. This is also a big one when you're conducting your zero angle. If it's not completely flat, if it's downhill or uphill, you need to tell the program even that. a little bit. Mm -hmm. One degree needs to be accounted for. Right, right. Um, altitude. So here we're getting into uh, altitude, pressure, temperature, humidity, our atmospheric conditions. So a couple different ways to get that. Obviously. Um, one of the best ways is with a Kestrel. Yeah. Uh, it measures all that stuff uh, right now. You can pair the Kestrel to the app. Uh, I think we'll do that maybe when we get to the HUD. You can do it from here. You see yeah. the pair meter up in the top right there. Yep. It just Bluetooths it to the Kestrel and pulls in whatever it's measuring. Simple. Um, if you don't have a Kestrel and you're you're kind of you know searching like weather forecast information to get stuff, there might be some error involved. Sure. Between uh, corrected and uncorrected pressure. Yeah. And and even beyond that, if you find yourself in really dire straits and you don't have connectivity and you don't have any device to measure the weather, uh, it's never a bad idea to just kind of calibrate yourself um, to temperature. We have something in here I'll show you when we get to the HUD on pressure, um, where if you at least know your approximate altitude, it'll automatically update the pressure for you. I'll talk a little bit about that when we get there. But temperature wise, I mean, you can can gauge the temperature probably within 10 degrees just by how you feel mm -hmm. it you know I especially mean, we, as an outdoorsman you know like the people that are using ford off they're outside they're hunters they're shooters mm -hmm. they're competitors so yeah you're you spend your life outside like you said you can be pretty accurate with that surprisingly accurate in some cases yeah just understand that like you said error in error out so if you if you're not giving it absolute information or as close to absolute as you can get you may have some error okay. but uh, pretty standard stuff there, right? Altitude, pressure, temperature, humidity. It needs all four of those yep. is, is the key message there. Now, wind speed. Wind speed and wind direction. I can't, Critical. I, yeah, I cannot uh, stomp my foot hard enough about how important it is during this zero angle process to put in that information. Yep. Because aerodynamic jump is occurring. It's, it's impacting where each bullet hits your target 
at your zero target distance. Even at 104 yards in this case. Even at 104, yes. Yep. And so you need to tell the program that information. Yep. Obviously, you want to try to uh, conduct this process just like any zeroing process. You want to try to do it in as low a wind a situation or as low wind variability situation as you can. So if you've got no option and it's, you know, it, it's always windy where you live, kind of like it is here in Nebraska, I might have to zero in a 10 mile an hour wind. I would rather zero in a 10 mile an hour wind that's a constant 10 than a three mile an hour wind that's dropping to zero and going up to nine. Right? Yeah. That would be a worse situation, yeah. even though the number is lower and more attractive. But yeah, it's very important to note that even at a hundred yards, mm -hmm. that the, the effects of aerodynamic jump are occurring that's and right. are measurable. That's right. And ladies and gentlemen, listening into the podcast, Jaden Quinlan has a foot and he just stopped it. <laughs> okay. Continuing on, uh, post foot stomp. Yep. So we need good wind speed and we need good wind direction. So the wind direction here, um, is in, in, in degrees. So, uh, 90 degree is a right to left straight crosswind. 270 is left to right. 180 is tailwind. Zero is headwind. And then you know, every single degree in between there. And again, right. hypercritical that you're as accurate as you possibly can. Yeah. And that is the wind direction in relation to your bullet vector. Correct? That's right. Okay. That's right. And if, if you're just doing this, you know, just by your ability to judge it, there's going to be some error there. I mean, some error is okay, right? We're always going to have some error. Yeah. Try to get it as accurate as you can. Throwing a Kestrel on a wind vane mount on a tripod is a great way to do that because then you can essentially record the min, max, and average angles that were found, and you can put in that average angle and that average speed. That would be the ultimate way to do it. Perfect. Um, impact height. So here's where, you know, we shoot our target. We're, we're just going to throw this up. Yeah. The here original we... example from the video that's on the home screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah use that one right there. <laughs> so this impact height and impact windage input. First, we'll do impact height. So where this number comes from is if our point of aim is here at this at the center of this target, we can see that each of our bullets is a little bit low to varying degrees from that. Mm -hmm. So what we would do is preferably with calipers, you would measure from the point of aim to the center of each bullet hole. And you would do that for each impact, write them down as you go, average them at the end, just like you show in that video. And that becomes your average uh, impact, height. impact height. And we do the same thing for windage. So we'd measure to the right or to the left. Now within the app, um, impact height, if if it's above the point of aim, it's a positive value. If it's below the point of aim, it's negative. Sure. If it's to the right of the point of aim, it's positive. If it's to the left of the point of aim, it's negative. That's how it denotes those. So let's say in this example here, we have the numbers pre-calculated down below. So it's low by 0 0.205 inches. We didn't put that. Now, another common question we get here is, do I need to... Um, do I need to adjust or can I leave it alone? Technically, you can leave it alone. The program doesn't care where you hit. I mean, you could aim here and hit, you know, four inches high and three inches right. The program doesn't care at all. It'll calculate just fine based on that information. Most folks, though, want a zero that's pretty close to cool. their point of aim. Right. And so if you want to adjust it, adjust away. There's, there's no problem with that. Just whatever your final result is, tell the program that. Yep. And I agree. You know, I've, I typically will get within a half of an inch left and right, and then approximately one inch or less high mm -hmm. at, a, at my zeroing target distance, which is usually 101 yards. Right. For me, that's just that way if, you know, things go south or if I take that same rifle out to shoot a coyote or something, like I know I'm in the ballpark of point of aim, point of impact at 100. Yep. And then we have, so we put in uh, 0.205 for yeah, our- Minus 0.205. Yeah, I need to be minus. I need to update that. Minus 0.205, that's for our impact height. Okay. And then our windage, we're right by 0 0.140 inches. So that's going to be a positive. I'm going to move this just so yeah. they can see it on the screen. Sure. Yeah, that's an important point. So if it's to the right of your point of aim, it's a positive number. And if mm -hmm. it's to the left, it's a minus. And so another thing you can do, this was set to inches. You can see your units in that uh, kind of gray text right there. And that's the default. <clears throat> that's the default because we would prefer that you go get your target and actually measure it with a caliper. There may be a circumstance where you can't do that. You're at a public range. You have to wait for the whole range line to go cold before you can go down and retrieve your target. You don't have that much yeah. time. You're using the grid system on the target or something. Right. Or you could mill it mm -hmm. or measure the minutes in, in your reticle if it's set to the, to the right magnification on a second focal plane or if it's a front focal plane, you're good. But if you do either one of those, you can hit this height and windage unit option and that allows you to select between say, you know, 
uh, inches and centimeters, uh, MRAD, and minute of angle. So that's how you would you would deal with that, say, in that circumstance at the range. But we yeah. did it in inches the way we would we would recommend. Once all that information has been put in, we hit find zero angle. What's going to happen in the program is it takes all that information we put in there and it says, okay, the only way that you can hit 0.205 inches low, 0.14 inches to the right under all of these conditions is if the angle of the barrel is this when you fired. So if we hit find zero angle, that's that angle, 0 0.085 degrees. It's crazy. You know, we talked about it on the last, last podcast. Like if you have a BC uh, Kestrel, mm -hmm. you could put 25 gun profiles in there mm -hmm. or, or however many. And ours, you can put three. Mm -hmm. The computational power required of Ford off, and that's a good example. In a click of a button, it ran a very long iterative process it did. to find what that zero angle was. And in the snap of a finger, it tells you the exact angle that your barrel is pointed in relation to your line of sight through the optic for that exact zero to be true. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. It's essentially taking the the barrel in the program and raising it up by tiny little degrees and saying, do you match? Do you match? Do you match? And it just keeps saying no until it finds the match. Okay. This is the angle that results in this happening. Wow. Now, one again, like we've said in prior podcasts, once you find that zero angle, you're good. You don't have to redo this every time you go to a match or to a hunt in a different condition or place or whatever. Um, really awesome yeah. feature. Mechanically, as long as everything is sound, mm -hmm. there's no reason to redo it. Right. So that kind of sums up the set rifle info area. I know we spent a little bit of time in there, but hopefully there's no questions after sure. that. So we hit the back button up here on the top right. Uh, the next fields we have down here, um, input and output uh, options. So you have input. This is a universal setting for this favorite. So if we, if we select that option, you can choose between metric or standard. What that means is for this specific favorite, no matter what phone you open it on, how many times you open it, if it's set to standard, it's going to use standard inputs. If it's set to metric, your sight height will be in millimeters. Your velocity will be in meters, meters per, per second, second, right? That, that's what that setting is. Okay. Now, output distance units. This one's really important because this is the universal setting for this favorite on whether you're going to work in yards or meters. And so uh, we'll be able to change this later temporarily if you'd like to. You need to yeah. swap between the two. But this is also a big area that people get caught in they're working in the wrong units. They have their favorite file set to US standard yards, um, but they're working on a rangefinder that's running meters and they find out that I'm hitting high or low or whatever. This could be one of the reasons why. Got so it. this is where you check that. So if you want to work in meters, you know, maybe ex-military and you're used to working in meters, you would set this to metric and then it's going to operate that file in meters for your output. All your inputs are still your standard, you know, uh, ones that you're used to. Okay. Down here at the very bottom is your results. Do you want it in mils, minutes, inches, centimeters? That's where you select that stuff. Um, I'm a mil guy, so we'll go with MRAD. After all that's done, at the top right, you hit save. If you didn't hit save by accident and you hit this back button, it'll prompt you and say, hey, you changed something within here. Would you like to save it? So kind of like on a computer, yep. you know, so you don't lose all your work. Yep. I've seen that happen. It's not pretty. Yeah. <laughs> So after you've made your first favorite, it looks like this. It shows up here. If you would have taken a picture, that picture would show itself. You can see the name there. Um, if we hit the, the little ellipse thing, the three dots over here on the right, it pops open a whole bunch of different options for us. You can edit it if you need to go back in and change something, update muzzle velocity or something like that. You can clone it. Um, this is really nice feature if you're going to shoot multiple bullet types or different loads through one rifle. You can clone it and it pulls all of your sight height. Everything is the same as the last file. Then you just go in there and change whatever is pertinent. Yeah, your bullet, different. your velocity. Mm -hmm. You can also share. This is a really cool feature. So you and I are going out on a hunt together. We're both flying in from different locations to wherever we're going to hunt. And, um, you know, my phone battery might die. Your phone battery might die. So real quickly, we can share our favorites to each other, and then we have a backup system. Yep. Or I've got a buddy that took my rifle out, you know, to go coyote hunting and forgot to give him the information for it. I can send this to him in a text message, in an email, on social media, you know, Whatever. essentially wherever you share a QR code. Yep. Um, that's that's what this is. Yeah. Really, really cool. handy. What we used it for internally, I think more than anything, is, oh, so-and-so wants to shoot a match. They haven't shot a match before. He's going to run this rifle with this ammo mm -hmm. and oh here, yeah, i'll let you borrow my gun and, and you know here you go and you can just send them that and they can go to the match and know that they're dialed in they don't have to question their data mm -hmm. which is huge because especially for new shooters man you start questioning is this number correct and right wheels fall off that's quick. right 
Okay, so those are those options. Um, we're going to select the file, which is just picking anywhere up in here where you could hit the select button. And that takes us to our HUD, our heads up display. Um, right now, I think it's actually in range card because it has an A yeah. up there. But within the HUD up at the top here, you have your name. That's what I was talking about. You know, maybe you want to put your bullet or your load in there so that you can make sure you're shooting the yeah. right thing. Suppressed or unsuppressed. Yep. At any time, you can hit this edit rifle info and that takes you straight back to that screen there. You know, if you need Muzzle to do velocity. a quick update on yep. something. Yep. It also is a good place to have that, even if you don't want to change something, if you got to ash and check something. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's not lining up right. What do I got in there for velocity? Exactly. Or exactly. There's that prompt where, hey, did you, did you need to resave this because you changed something? Yep. Um, edit environment, this text up here on the top left in red, if you hit that, this is where you input your environmentals. So altitude, uh, I mentioned before that we have a... We have a, a formula in here where as you update the altitude, it will update the pressure per what pressure yeah. typically changes based on altitude. So if we take it from 4,125 feet showing 25.71 inches of mercury, I take that to 10,000. You can see the pressure automatically changed to yep. 20.6. And they, they are relatively linear. Mm -hmm. Okay, They are, but they, that, that can't account for weather fronts. So right. when you get a high pressure front or a low pressure front that comes in, that's going to change that yeah. baseline pressure more. Um, but if you find yourself in a circumstance where this thing's broke or it's not working, whatever you're measuring your environmentals with is not available to you, this at least gets you in the ballpark. Yep. That's a, yeah. And that's really handy for, uh, yeah, instances like that. And I'm the first one to say redundancy to me is, I, I find it very almost soothing, mm -hmm. cathartic almost to have redundancy as we always joke, two is one, one is none. You have a pair, you have a spare, but I have, yeah, the Kestrel, I have a watch that's got an altimeter and barometer on it. Yep. Uh, and you've got obviously the sensors in your smartphone. Uh, it's always great to have redundancy, but in the event you don't, you've got kind of a built-in fail safe here. Right. Uh, temperature, pretty self-explanatory. Humidity, same thing. Um, if we go down here to edit units down here on the bottom, this is where you can custom pick what unit you want to operate in. Yeah. Um, we see this a lot in, in you know, Europe and some of the overseas countries where they want to be able to change that stuff. So that's what that would be. When we come back out of there, we display to you what your environmentals are because mm -hmm. that's really important, right? All yeah. those environmentals are going to, going to affect the trajectory. So having them displayed to you just makes that right that redundancy of yes the correct number is being used yep you can very quickly at a glance go that's incorrect or that's not you know that is correct okay i gotta look at something else mm -hmm. um this gray these we have three gray boxes up here the one on the top left is shooting angle mm -hmm. so this is uphill or downhill and if you if you select that that box um it uses the device's inclinometer and so it will give you the ability to measure that angle typical ways to use this is hold your phone or device up and, and sight, sight down over the flatness of it, and, and you can then capture it and use that angle. Um, you can also get it from some other device, right? Range finders, a Range lot of finders, them will yeah. give you that. Because you can so, manually input. Right, so yeah. if you hit this this override text down here at the bottom, you can manually type in whatever that is. Obviously, negative is for downhill, positive is for uphill. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a um, Vectronics Terrapin X, it will pull that every time. So you can pair that with Ford off uh, via wow. Bluetooth and it will automatically update any angle or range information as well as azimuth, which is the next one, firing azimuth. So before we go into firing azimuth, we're going to skip over here to earth-based effects on the right. What a lot of folks kind of paraphrase as to Coriolis. Yeah, Coriolis, a lot, uh, Yatvos, all that kind of stuff. Um, you see up at the top, there's a toggle for earth-based effects. This is where you can turn it on and off. Um, a lot of shooters that are not going past time of flights of about one second, which is going to be, you know, 800 to 1,000 yards, they typically won't even use earth-based effects because the effects are so small that it's not worth having to continually update your azimuth of fire, you know, for each different, like at a competition or something. Mm -hmm. So some people don't use it. If you want the ultimate in this thing's ability to put out good information, you should. Yep. Um, so you can turn it on. When you turn it on, you need to tell it what latitude you're at. That's very important information. So you can click the latitude button. You can either use your GPS to automatically pull that in, or you can manually type the number in over here. Once earth-based effects are turned on, now the firing azimuth uh, allows you to get your, your direction your, of fire. Your, yes, exactly. So you, you select that. It pulls up the phone's compass. 
or your device's compass. So it gives you the ability to measure it that way. Again, from a device or something like that, you can manually override it yeah. down here at the bottom. But it's really handy just to be able to point. It's got an icon of a bullet. Mm -hmm. You just point the bullet the direction you're shooting, hit capture, done. Right. Yep. That's, that's a really useful tool and really easy to use. Yep. Uh, let's talk about, actually, let me circle back to the parameter. Yeah, I was going to say, the, as far as environmentals go, kind of the ultimate way is pair it to a device that is on this planet specifically to capture environmental data like a Kestrel. Right. So we've got a Kestrel sitting here. Um, Bluetooth is on on the Kestrel. So if I hit pair meter up here, it allows me to toggle on the use weather meter. Yeah. Now, this this app works with uh, Kestrels. Um, I believe it's 5500 series and above. Okay. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. It's been a while. And it also uses the weather flow. Weather flow. Mm -hmm. Correct. So once that toggles on, it's going to do a Bluetooth search. Um, some issues we've we've seen with this is make sure your location is on. So some of the like uh, native Bluetooth settings in certain phones, whether it's Android or, or Apple, um, they need that location service okay. turned on to be able to to connect. Got it. Uh, you don't have to connect the device to your native Bluetooth of the phone before going into the Fordoff app and doing it. You don't have to mess with that. You can just do it from the app. So obviously it picked up this Kestrel. Uh, in the case of a Kestrel, there's a serial number on the back if it hasn't been named. So a lot of times when you do this at a match, you're going to get like a list of them that pop yeah. up. Um, and if you, you know, you don't want to depend on how somebody else is treating their Kestrel, uh, make sure you pick yours. Uh, one of the downsides is like leaving this thing out in the sunshine. It's going to get heated up yep. and that's going to give you false information. But we got some ways to, to account for that. So anyway, you, you see it pop up, you select it. Uh, it's going to, to connect itself. Once it does, you see that check mark. Now from here, you can enter into that device. When you enter in, you see all the information it's pulling and feeding into Fordoff. Perfect. Wind, speed, direction, altitude, humidity, pressure, and temperature yeah. all live being fed to Fordoff. Yep. And you can turn any of those off that you want. So Important. commonly, commonly what, what the way you're going to use the app is, unless the Kestrel is, is, or the weather flow is mounted on a wind vane mount on a tripod where it can, you know, live true itself to the wind direction with the speed. Um, you probably don't want those that data being fed from the Kestrel. Uh, so you can toggle those two off. Yeah, that's a big one. Wind speed direction to me, the way I use it for virtually every instance that I've ever used it, I have those turned off when I'm connected to the Kestrel. Mm -hmm. so I, I want to be the, the founder of the feast that says, this is the wind speed direction that I want data for. Yeah, I'm going to turn them on and go back. We have our wind speed and our wind direction. So wind speed is this scroll left to right, wind direction is this wheel here. So for wind speed, you simply just scroll it to the speed that you're that you're operating at. Um, wind direction, you put your thumbprint right there, and you can just spin this around to tell it where the wind's coming yeah. from. And it's important that you're, the bullet is pointed at the, at the direction of fire, mm -hmm. and that you need to move that wheel around in relation to the direction that you're firing. It's mm -hmm. not like a, oh, you know, it always assumes that up is north. Right. It, it, it's based off what direction you're firing. That's right. Over here on the left side is your, your range adjustment, so you can scroll up or down within that box. You can also tap anywhere in there and it will pull up a, a manual entry field. So if you're going from 300 yards to 1400, you don't have to scroll your way there. Yeah. You can just type it in and hit go and it takes you straight to it. Perfect. Um, down here at the bottom is where your solution is displayed, your come up and your windage solution. Each of those boxes, if we tap the come up box, it pulls up this one. This allows you to do a temporary change between yards and meters. It's not going to affect the favorite file because the favorite file we have set to yards right now. So if I close out of the app and I come back into it, it'll always open in yards. Yeah. But I'm at the range. Um, my range finder just went down. The battery died. And my buddy to the right of me has a range finder set to meters. Mm -hmm. Instead of making him switch back over, I can just toggle this over to yards. And then as long as I'm working in the HUD, it's going to work in yards instead of meters. And it's updates up here. That's top. right. It shows you right there whether you're in yards or meters. That's another really good acid check of, hey, I'm really far off on my elevation. What's going on? Make sure that that's set correctly. Yeah. Now, the other, the other areas of adjustment here is I can also change my units. So I, I natively, I'm working in MRAD because that's how I set my favorite file. But I might want to know what that is in inches or maybe in minutes because my buddy is working in minutes. I can temporarily, if I select inches, I can temporarily change my come up to display in inches. Now, if I again, if I exit back out and come back into the HUD, it will go back to MRAD. Okay. Same thing with the windage here. Now, 
the other button that uh, comes up when you select your come up is come up calibration. So this is the axial form factor. We saw that in the set rifle info. We talked about it on past podcasts. What the come up calibration is for is any little differences in drag between your barrel, your bullet, your powder, whatever it is. Muzzle device. Muzzle device. They, uh, they're going to affect the drag just slightly and going to cause you to hit high or low. And so this allows you to, to correct for that. So let's just say we're shooting at, I don't know, 900, 900 yards. The average file, which is what this is set to, is telling us we would need 8.1 mils up to hit the center of that target under yeah. these conditions. Under those wind conditions. And, yeah, because if, if the wind speed set to 10 right now, it's saying 8.1 mils up. If we drop the wind to zero, 8 mils. That is a tenth yeah. of a mil. In Just wind in there. wind speed. And that doesn't include wind direction because wind direction can really start playing with stuff. It can. Yeah. It definitely can. So the adjustment is, let's say, okay, just for the sake of argument, we're shooting in a no wind condition. Uh, we need eight mils to hit the center of the target, but we're hitting a tenth of a mil high. What I can do, and consistently and statistically valid, a tenth of a mil high, not like one or two shots on a tenth of a mil high. Uh, I, can, I can simply touch that come up box, do come up calibration. When I go to come up calibration, it brings you to the axial form factor page. There's a big description up here that tells you about, hey, we recommend you do this between 0.5 and 1.3 second time of flight. Generally, that's four to 800 yeah. yards, most cartridges. And we could show folks how to determine that uh, after this. Right. Yeah, because right. there's a way in Ford Off that you can just, oh, that's mm -hmm. that's how long it takes. And it, it explains pretty much all that in there. Now, there's three different ways to handle the axial form factor. They all do the same thing. They're just different ways to do it, depending on how you want to. Mm -hmm. We'll start with the bottom one, manual selection. So if we select manual selection, it's going to bring up a table of all of the different axial form factors we could pick and what their associated come up values would be. So right now we're operating at an axial form factor of 1.0. Oh, that was in, uh, we had toggled it to meters. You see the difference there? Yeah. So we have it set to 900 meters, but it showed in yards in axial form yeah. factor because that's how our file is natively set. All right. Once we came back in and, and, and corrected everything to yards, which we're operating in, we set it to 900. It's showing 6.68 uh, mils is what we need to hit the center of that target. Let's say that, you know, we're actually hitting at, you know, 6.8, we're a little over you know, tenth two tenths, mil. a tenth, two tenths low. So we can hit the come up calibration in here. We'll first go to the manual selection. So once we come into the manual selection, this is just a, a giant table. And at 1.0, that's where the file is going to start. If you've never adjusted it before, axial form factor is defaulted to 1.0. You see it's t telling us to hold 6.68 mils. 6.7 mils. We're hitting at 6.9, right? So all we have to do is scroll down in this table and find where we're at 6.9, which would be there, an axial form factor of 1.07. Okay. We select that. We hit the back button. Hit save. And now our HUD shows us needing 6.9. So it calibrated it. Now we'll go back in to talk about the other methods. In manual selection again, let's say that we were hitting at 7.2 mils. So we had 6.7 dialed on our optic. We shot and we're actually impacting at 7.2. So we come into axial form factor and we hit the limit. And at the limit, it's at seven mils even. We yeah. need another two tenths. Something well, else. There's a message there that says, if you are using 1.1 axial form factor and still impacting low on target, please check all inputs for accuracy. That's one of those fail safes that we talked about on the prior podcasts mm -hmm. where you can't screw this thing up. It'll, it'll stop you from, from making a crazy adjustment that's not yep. correct. And that, that 1.1, 1 .1, uh, I mean, 10% of, of drag, we, that is such a small use case. We rarely ever see it be as bad as mm -hmm. 10% or rare. as different because it's not necessarily bad. It's just different. Right. Um, usually it's into the tune of 1% to 5 or 6%. Right. So if you hit that circumstance, go back, make sure the right bullet's selected. Make sure you're in yards or meters, whichever one you're supposed to be. Your velocity's right. All those things, yeah. right? Yeah, sight height, zero mm -hmm. range, zero angle. Okay, so we finished up manual selection. Let's go into use impact location. So what use impact location is, is a method of doing it where you tell it I'm two tenths high or I'm two tenths low instead of telling it I'm 6.9 mils. So just okay. a different way to handle it. So we go into that. You can see this is what it told us to hold 6.7 mils. That's what we had dialed on the optic. But we shot a whole bunch of times and we're averaging about 0.2 low. Okay. Right? Two tenths. So we would say 0.2 and we're low. 
So we toggle that over to low. When we hit calculate, it calculates the axial form factor. If we hit use, and we come back to our HUD, you can see that shows us 6.9, needing 6.9, which is what we needed. We just did the use impact location method. Now we'll do the use total come up. So instead of telling it I hit 2 tenths low, I'm going to tell it I hit it 6.9 instead of 6.7. Okay. So all three methods get to the same end result. It's just whatever you prefer to do. Yeah. Uh, so we go into the use total come up. It looks a lot like that use impact location one. Right. Tells us we need 6.7, but we're going to tell it I need 6.9. I hit calculate, and it calculates the number for me. Yep. Um, this table down here in the bottom allows you to do it by shot. Too. Okay. So if you had a spotter, you're shooting on the gun, he can record. Yep. He says, all right, that, that specific shot was two tenths low. He can put that in. Or in this case, you hit it 6.8. And then, you know, each shot you do that, and then it'll average it all for you. Okay. So just depending on how you want to do it, it gives you both options. Sure. Okay, once we've, once we've kind of got all that handled, that's the majority of, of what works on the HUD. Um, down here on the bottom right is the table view. This is where you can find that specific time of flight information to know that you're in that optimum window for the axial form factor adjustment. So if we hit that, the first thing it's going to ask you is how far do you want your table to go and what the interval is. It's defaulted to those numbers. You can adjust them as you need to. And then if you scroll all the way over to the right, we have our time of flight column. And we said uh, between 0.5 and 1.3 seconds time of flight would be axial form factor. So we would want to be somewhere between four and 500 yards out to about 1,000. That yep. would be the optimum window to yep. do your axial form and factor I've, in. What I've always recommended to people, and I'm, like I said, somewhat considered an advanced user, but not like you. Uh, what I've always recommended to people is look at that time of flight, and it's 0.5 to 1.3. I would choose a location the furthest away that I feel the most confident. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that's usually between six and 800 yards. Um, you know, for, would it be better to do it further away? Maybe, but my ability to shoot a really good group size that I can trust is, you know, valid and representative mm -hmm. of, of the system. I prefer to do that, you know, inside of a half a mile, yeah. usually just because my ability is better than if it is at a thousand, there's less variables at play. Right. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. Um, Within this table view, you have a breakdown of everything. Uh, there's your total come up, your total windage, your gyroscopic stability, your no wind trajectory. So what is your trajectory without aerodynamic jump? Mm -hmm. What is the raw aerodynamic jump value? Wind drift and spin drift separated out. Those two in combination are your total windage. Okay. Uh, velocity, you might want to check that, say, for a hunting circumstance to make sure your bullet's still going to work. Uh, you have energy if you need to see that for hunting applications. And then across the top, you can scroll and it shows you all the inputs that are being used to generate that table. It's the same ones you had set on the HUD. Mm -hmm. um, if you're out shooting one day and you're like, man, this file is perfect, like everything is, is awesome. Up here at the top right, you can hit save result and you can save this table and all of that information. And it's kind of a nice way to record keep of, you know, hey, everything was great on this day. And then you come back out on another day. And uh, maybe there's something wrong or whatever. You can kind of go back and check things. Okay. So that's the purpose of that. Now, maybe a couple little pro tip bits of information. Um, one thing I like to do, again, you can Bluetooth with the Kestrel to the app, and that's very handy. I rarely do it because I find a lot of times now I have to pay attention to the app and I have to pay attention to the Kestrel. Is it turned on? Is it sitting out in the sun? Is, you know, do I have the wind speed and wind direction turned off so that I can edit it? You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, for me, it's just as easy to turn the Kestrel on, go through the environmental conditions and manually type them in there. They don't change that rapidly usually. Mm -hmm. So say I'm at a match or something, I'll, I'll go in between stages and just check. Turn yep. my Kestrel on. Did the temperature change more than a degree or two? If it did, then I'll update it. If it didn't, I just leave it alone. Yep. I think for me... Mm -hmm. I do something very similar, whether it's a match or a hunt, I do the same thing. Before everything starts, I pair them once, mm -hmm. turn the Kestrel off, put it in my pack, move on about my life. Sometime, like at a match between the first stage and about lunchtime, I'll pair it again. Mm -hmm. Then I'll do that again between lunchtime and the end of the match. And then one of my last, maybe two stages of the day, I'll usually repair it mm -hmm. um, just to yeah, keep it up to date. And I do that while hunting as well. Yeah. Before I leave the truck, I'll pair them. I'll move on with my life. Uh, if there's a break in the hunting, I'll pair them again. If I break for lunch, I'll pair them again. 
uh, and I just, it, to me, it's yeah easier to control the one thing right. rather than have to worry about two pieces of kit. Yep. Um, another point being that the adjustments for wind are so easy on this app, a, a really handy thing to do is as soon as you start shooting at some distance, let's say your first target's at four or 500 yards, you make your best stab at what the wind conditions are, right? Let's say I think it's five miles an hour and it's straight right to left. Um, so I dial in my scope and I hit six point, you know, I'm, I'm dialing in 6.6 .6 mils like it tells me and I'm holding 0.6 mils right. Well, let's say when I actually hit the target, I was hitting 0.3 mils. I needed to hold 0.3 mils, right? Half the hold, right? Well, as you shot, the wind experienced the bullet all the way to the target. It's the best judge of the wind that's actually yeah. there. It's better than you and your perceptions. Yeah, we've got a lot of friends that say that. Believe the bullet. Yeah. So the first thing to do is the app is telling me, based on how I have it set, that I need to hold six tenths for wind. But I observed on target after multiple shots that no, it's actually three tenths. So back that wind speed off until it shows three tenths. And then ask yourself if that's believable. Can I believe that the wind speed is actually three miles an hour and not five? If the answer to that question is no, then you need to look at your wind direction because maybe you don't have yeah, that set correctly. A couple degrees. When you start talking about headwinds and full value winds and tailwinds, when mm -hmm. you're talking about those cardinal directions, a couple of degrees can make an instrumental difference. It's Absolutely. incredible. So if we go back, you know, if we go back to that five miles an hour we thought it was and we move our wind angle a little bit and we get down to the three tenths that it showed that we needed on target, well, is it possible that the wind is actually coming from that angle instead of that angle? Those are those questions you need to ask yourself. So for the listener, we had it set to 90 degrees and it showed needing six tenths of wind. If I back that down to 143 degrees, so a little over halfway to a tailwind, it also shows three tenths of wind is needed. So acid check yourself there. Yeah. Once you have that set though, then as you continue to shoot at different ranges, you've essentially calibrated the wind uh, deflection or the horizontal deviation with wind deflection and spin drift combined that you're observing on target, you've, you've made the app represent that. Now, when you change the condition, say the range, and we go to a 600 yard target, it's going to give us better data mm -hmm. when we do that. Yeah. That's those little pro tips right there that you can use this and the HUD is so interactive and so useful compared to, you know, something a little more, you know, kind of analog style. This is so useful in live time. Mm -hmm that you can correct those things and find like, oh, okay, well, is it believable that it was three and not six? Eh, not quite. Is it believable that it was 143, not 90? Not quite, but maybe a combination of the two. Sure. And you can true those things up so that your next stage, your first round win call is that much better. Right. Absolutely. Um, maybe we should talk a little bit about the additional features. Yeah. So I think that's a really good setup um, from walking through, getting started, to get your profile set up and how to use it and a couple pro tips, that's awesome. But there are some two in-app features that we don't talk a ton about, but they're incredibly useful. I think they cost a buck a piece. Um, they're not really expensive. They're the only two paid features in the app right now. Um, but again, they're quite useful and uh, they each have their different use case. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, let's walk through what each of them are and, and what's the best way to use them. Okay, so let's start with multi-HUD, which is this one on the top right. Looks like a couple different like computer screen tabs. Uh, if you hit multi-HUD, you have a back button and a plus button. You hit the plus button and you can create your first HUD. So your HUD was that heads up display that we just went through in detail. But in this case, you can name it. So this is very handy for like a hunting situation, say from a blind or, or from a static location, a good glassing point or something. And you have some areas that that are worth concentrating on, right? I have a, I have the, the entrance of a draw. Right, that might be a point where some some animals come out, or yeah. there's this elk wallow or something. Whatever it is, right? We can name it draw. You can name it anything you want, and when you create it, and you can create a bunch of them. Let's just say rock. There's a pertinent rock that that we've seen animals at before, whatever it is. Um, you create these, and we can go in. We go into the rock one, and you can see up top it shows us rock. Right. Well, we can set that unique target package essentially yeah. on the screen, so yeah. it's. The firing it's that distance, the, range. the wind is those conditions for that target. And then we can go back to the multi-HUD. We can scroll over to the one that's for the draw where the animals might come out. And it is at that specific distance with these winds. You know, you can customize all that. And then as 
as you have that stuff pre-built, it's super easy to just quickly get from one to another. Right. So I can go from draw to rock in what two or three seconds. Yeah. And, two and you've clicks. got the you've got the right dope for that scenario. Yep. And the other nice part is the only limitation to this is your device's internal storage. And on on iPads or tablets or cell phones, that's generally pretty big. So when you compare it to say like in the Kestrel, um, you know, there's there's certain uh, versions out there where you can do target cards and all that kind of stuff, but they're limited in how much they can hold. There's no limit to this. Yeah. And you can leave it set up. So if I exit out of this with it set to rock and draw, if I exit out of the app and I go about and go to work for another week and then I come back to that same location to hunt again, I pull up in the app, those are still pre-built in yeah. there. And update your atmospherics and your wind conditions and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So that's what the, the multi-HUD feature is. It's very handy for like hunting and stuff like yep. that. The next feature is, is up here, the little grid looking one, and that's a custom range card. Yeah, that one to me, of the two, uh, the multi-HUD is really nice, but the, the range card to me is the most useful for what we do. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the competitive shooters uh, will also agree with that. Yeah, and this was built with competition shooting in mind. So this screen looks very similar. We hit the plus sign, and we're going to create a new range card. We can name it, let's just say, you know. Stage one. Match. Yeah, stage one would actually be better because w what we do with this feature is when we show up to a match and we get the match book the day before, we go to our hotel room that night and we build all the stages into the phone. And so then when you show up to shoot the match, it's all done. It's all, yep. it's all right there. Um, so we do stage one, we create it. And when I tap on it, it's pretty blank right now. So in the bottom left is the plus sign. You hit that and you can either create a single target which is what it is up here, and you can name that target, or you could create a bunch of targets based on a max range and an inter interval. Mm -hmm. So for competition shooting, I might just do a single target and I put them in one at a time. Um, maybe if I just want a custom range card, I'm out at the range or whatever, I could do, you know, an interval of, okay. you know, every, give me every 25 yards for a thousand yards. Now, when I hit create multiple targets, it automatically builds that in. Now, right now, each of the targets has a generic name. I can go in and update that. So if I click anywhere in there on that target one, it takes me to the adjustment page. Up at the top, I can change that to be, you know, KYL rack. And I can set the conditions unique for that specific target. I can change the range. I can change the wind. I can change the shooting angle and the firing azimuth. Then I can just hit the arrow button and go to the next target to the next and adjust one. that one. So that's yep. the easy, really quick way to build them. Um, there's the set all features. So especially at competitions, it's pretty common that all of your targets are in a you know similar enough azimuth that the wind conditions are going to be the same for all of them, right? All of them are going to be a right to left crosswind at X mile an hour. So you can use that to universally set those conditions in that range card. So I can say, all right, my wind speed is 10 mile an hour. I'm going to set that wind speed to all of them. And my wind direction is from here. And I'm going to set that to all of them. Now, when I come back to my table, the wind speed is all set to 10 and it's all set to the same angle. Yep. Or I could customize any one that I needed to. So that's a pretty handy, handy feature. Um, and you can have multiple of these cards. Yeah. Again, only limited by your phone storage. So I have this one built. If I hit back. It shows me down here the name of it. I can do another card for stage two. Yeah, that's been really handy for me. And I think everybody here that helped with this is to go back and to prepare, read through the matchbook. And, you know, none of us are out there winning matches, but we are there to be competitive and do as best we can. And so, yeah, we go, we read the matchbook, we read the stage brief, and then you create these profiles. And in your mind, you're already building an idea of how you're going to approach that stage. And when you get to that stage, you're not, you know, doing anything crazy. You can just walk up, go, okay, update my wind speed direction. All my target ranges are already pre-input. If there's mm -hmm. a change to range, update it, no big deal. And your dope's good to go. You write it down and you yep. move on and you can become very systematic. And I think developing systems like that uh, make you more confident going up to shoot a match. That's right. And the environmental, so you build this the night before, how are you supposed to know what the environmentals are going to be like when you get back out through the next day? Um, the environmental conditions can be updated and it doesn't affect, you know, any of these settings in here. 
So I can come in and say, okay, I'm starting stage one. It's 30 degrees out. These are my conditions. I hit save. And you can see it reflected up there. Now that's universal for all the, the range cards that you've built. So if I go from the stage one card and I go to the stage two card, it's now using that same yeah. condition. So that's really handy. Um, another kind of pro tip that I've seen guys use, and I don't remember if it was you or, or another buddy that, that taught me this, but um, you essentially can create, like for hunting, go in and create a custom uh, target array. And what I like to do is, you know, early on in the bullet's trajectory, the, the amount of difference in drop and wind isn't a lot. So like up front, I might do like started at 200 yards and then 300, 350, 400, 425, 450, 475, 500. You know, you start then, getting yeah, it more 5, finite. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Right. Yep. yep. And so you can, you can set this table that way, screenshot it. And then set that as your home screen image on your phone. Oh, that was not and me that taught you that, but that's a cool idea. <laughs> yeah, it, it might have been uh, it might have been Jimmy if he's listening. Uh. Uh, but then, all instead of having to go into your phone, you know, you see that massive bull elk, and you you know you're weak in the knees. <laughs> yeah, well, well, what do I need? You know, yeah. and uh, instead of having to go all the way into your phone, unlock your security screen, go into the app, make sure you're on the right screen. You simply just hit your power button on your phone to wake it up and it's sitting right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it as perfect as, you know, truing up the wind speed and getting all that stuff? No. But is it good enough to, to make up for that time savings? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the great things about, yeah, Ford off. Uh, it's so complex that if you want to shoot the wings off a gnat, you know, at 2000 yards, great. You can take your time, set everything up, do everything perfect. And yeah, you can do that mm -hmm. uh, within your ability to shoot. But then you can also, because it's so powerful, you can, you know, you can go backwards too. Well, I don't need it to be perfect. I'm only shooting to 500 yards, but you can do stuff that fast. Mm -hmm. It's that convenient. Right. That's a, that is a good one. Yeah. Jimmy, if that was you, well done. <laughs> wow, Jaden. So that's, that's a really great overview of how to use Ford off and not just at the entry level. I mean, there's some, some pretty good tips and tricks in there. Um, now going back to some tips and tricks stuff. You mentioned that you can clone profiles and you use those for unsuppressed or different bullets, whatever. Let's go back and talk about that a little bit more because to me, that's one of the most valuable features in setting up a, a, a favorites profile, okay. creating an account and logging in because you can do that. You can create a profile for yeah, high or low or different bullets or whatever. So walk us through how you do that. Sure. Okay. So I come back to my favorites screen here. I hit the three dots, the ellipse, and I hit clone. You want to clone it in Ford off, of course. Clone it in Ford off. Let's say that I was taking my match rifle and I was going to, my 6.5 Creedmoor match rifle, and I was going to go out with some 95 V Maxes and do some coyote hunting. Well, the 95 V Max isn't in the Ford off library because it's not applicable for shooting at 1,500 yards. Um, in that case, I would clone it as BC. What that would do is take my rifle that's built, take it over to the BC side of the app, and then all I have to do is go in and pick the 95 V Max. Okay. So that's, that's handy in that form as well. But as I clone it, it does that. It creates an exact clone. So I have two of, of the, the files that I built. I'm going to come in and edit the second one that I made. And let's say I change it to 143. So I have my match load, my 140, and then my 143 ELDX hunting load. So I updated my name. I'm going to update my bullet. Pick the 143 ELDX. And then update any other pertinent information in there. You know, awesome. Maybe my set rifle info uh, is, is the same powder and everything, you know. Um, go in, update my velocity. We'll say it's uh, 2695. Now, here's an interesting point. Zero angle. With I've, I've seen this go both ways. With high-quality barrels, I've seen where you can set up your zero angle with one load and simply go in and update the bullet and velocity for a totally different load, and it will predict what's going to happen. So essentially, Whoa. you don't have to re-zero if you change the load. Now, it's highly dependent on the specifics of your barrel. There's no guarantee it's going to work that way. Okay. But with high-quality barrels, high-quality match-grade barrels, I've seen it work more often than it doesn't. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of cool. It's not a guarantee. Yep. Try it, confirm it, make sure it worked. Yep. But I've seen it happen. So, I, I have as well. And yeah, yeah we're... Uh, I, it blew me away the first time. I, I, the first time I was like, nah, mm -hmm. like when you told me about it several years ago, I was like, yeah, I don't believe you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you try it and so it let's, works. Let's, let's see, let's see what it does. Let's say our, our velocity was, you know, we're hand loading this bullet and it's a little bit slower. Let's just say 2620. 
we're going to leave our zero angle the same. And we're going to save it. So all we did was we updated it to a 143 ELDX updated velocity. Those are the only two differences in those files. Yep. Let's go to the HUD and see what it shows. So if we pick our original one, let's go to 104 yards, which is where we zeroed our gun. Let's say it's a no wind condition. So under these conditions, Fordoff is telling us that our bullet is going to hit 0.07 mils high. Or let's look at the inches. So we're going to hit a quarter inch high under those specific conditions. Okay. I can quickly switch to my other load just by selecting anywhere up there in that title box. So I can hit the title box. I can go to my 143 load. It's a different number. It's Whoa. 0.04. It's saying it's going to hit 0.14 inches high. Why is that? Because it's a different bullet. bullet different and it's, dynamics. It's predicting all of that from the start. So that's why it has the, the capability to do that if your barrel has the, the right conditions to support that. So that's kind of cloning in an initial stage, right? You can replicate it and change anything you want in there. Yep. Maybe another pro tip of something that I like to do, especially for my long range application stuff. What I do, I'm going to delete this other one I had just to keep the screen um, clean here. So we're back to my 140 match load. What I'm going to do is I'm going to clone it two times. I clone it once. And I clone it again. Now I have three files that are identical. I'm going to go into my original file. I'm going to hit edit. And I'm going to name it, so I'll do it up in the front here. I'm going to name it average, AVG. Hit save. That's now my average file. Because in that file, I put in my average muzzle velocity. I put in my average point of impact vertically yep. and horizontally, all that stuff, right? Now my next file, I'm going to go in, hit edit. I'm going to name it my high file. Now what I want to do with this file is feed it all the information that makes me hit high. Oh. So that's what's the highest velocity I expect to have. So I have velocity variation, right? I have an yeah. average velocity, but I also have an extreme spread and a standard deviation. Uh, most listeners are going to be familiar with that. What I do here is I go in and I put in what the highest recorded velocity I had was. Or if I want to be even more accurate with it, I'll base it on the standard deviation and the statistics that, that lie in that, which we'll get into in the statistics podcast. But essentially, I take my SD times that number by two, and I add that to my average. Okay. So as an example, let's say that my SD was 10. I'll come into my set rifle info. My average muzzle velocity was 2,700. If my SD is 10 times that by 2, that's 20. And I add that to my average. So Got I'm going to change this to 2,720. Whoops. 2,720. The next thing I do, when I shot this group on target, I have bullets that hit high and bullets that hit low. I go in and I measure from my um, point of aim to the highest impact. In this case, that's probably about zero. zero. Maybe, maybe a, I don't know, 50 thousandths below zero. So then what I do is I go in to find zero angle. I make sure all my information is correct. But in my impact height, instead of putting in that I hit 0.205 low, yep. I'm going to put in that I hit 0.05 low which is the highest shot in my group hit there, right? Because the highest shot in my group in combination with the highest velocity I expect to have make you hit is going to make me hit high down range. So once I've done those two, I save that file. That's now my high file. I go into that last one and I do the exact same thing but the low. So I name it low. Drop my muzzle velocity by 20, right? Because yep. that was SD times 2. And, and the reason I'm doing SD times 2 is that's going to account for about 95% of what's going to happen. Yes. As far, yeah, as far as uh, uh, normal distribution goes. Mm -hmm. So we'll go 2680. I go back into my find zero angle. And on this target, my lowest impact is, you know, these are half inch grid squares. So we're going to say 0.4 low. Okay. Just if you had calipers, quick, we'd use calipers, but for would. the sake of, uh, for instructional purposes only. So impact height, I'm going to say negative 0.4 inches. Now some listeners may say, well, you were also 0.14, right? You can certainly put that in, yeah. right? I'm just doing Again, this for as instructional an exercise, purposes. Right? Yeah, we're just. And I save that. Now I'm going to use my average file for getting all my ballistic solutions. That's the file I'm going to use most of the time. But I'm shooting, let's say, at 1,100 yards. 
and it's telling me 9.6 in these conditions. So I dial 9.6 on my scope. I fire the first round and I hit like a tenth low. And then, you know, the next round I hit it dead center. And then I hit three tenths low and then a tenth high, right? There's variability that's going to occur. But how do I know how much is too much or not? When is there a problem? Do I have something set wrong or is this yeah. just the noise in the system? What I can quickly do is hit this uh, title block up here and select my low file. Well, my low file says that the lowest round out of my group combined with the lowest muzzle velocity variability I measured, those two in combination are going to be the lowest impact at 1,100 yards, shows that I could have an impact down at 9.9. .9. And everything could be perfectly accurate. It's, it's just, just the noise in the system. Yeah. And so not in this system, in your firearm system. In yeah, the in the, the muzzle dispersion. velocity, yeah, the drag, drag variability, all of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we go back to the average again. So I've got 9.6 dialed on my scope. Anything between 9.6 and 9.9 .9 on the, you know, the low side of impacts, I can't argue with anything that impacts inside of there because it's within what I've measured as variability in my system. Now, that's 95% of the time. So if I get every single impact is down at 9.6, that's a large confirmed bias that's, you know, it shouldn't be every single time, but it's possible to get it that low. You know, 67% of the time, I'm probably going to be uh, between... You know, it's telling me 9.6, I'm probably going to be between 9.4 and 9.8. Probably a two-tenths window is going to be 67% of the time. But 95% of the time, I could be out in that window. Yeah. And so I use this to keep myself out of trouble. Because all too often, you look at this ballistic solution, you see something a little bit different happen downrange. In one or three shots. You immediately blame this. There's something wrong yeah. in here. Got to right? change the actual form factor. Right. So what this does is it just keeps you out of trouble there. And the other thing it... it it helps you with if we look at the high file you know it could be 9.4 so from 9.4 to 9.9 .9 to 9.9 .9 is the window that 95 percent of my bullets should be impacting and that's when you have everything perfectly dialed in ford office set up correctly you have good quality ammunition you have good quality bullets and you're still living within that amount of noise mm -hmm. and if you see anything different than that you're looking at a small sample size that's right so that that's something that I found very handy and has has helped me tremendously because you're going to miss sometimes and it's nice to know going into it, you know, is it possible for me to miss this target or absolutely not? You know, let's say that I'm shooting a, you know, a, a one mil tall target at that distance, I should not be missing that thing vertically. If right. I'm missing it, there's something else going on. So mm -hmm. it, it it narrows down the variables that are at fault for you to try to identify the one that's actually wrong. Yep. So that's, that's kind of the goal with that. That's huge. And even if you did that just when you're setting things up, even if you didn't let three of those profiles exist forever, but you, let's say you get a 300 PRC and you're dialing it in and you're, you're going to run ELR matches mm -hmm. and you're trying to get every nut, bolt and screw properly adjusted and you go out for, you know, a couple of days on the range consecutively to make sure everything's you know, dialed in and running right to have that and to have that acid check is just huge. And knowing yeah, like you said, all too often, people are real quick to grab a knob and adjust it. Mm -hmm. The axial form factor, and I know that's true from watching people chase their tail adjusting BCs and muzzle velocities. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a really neat way that to, to show yourself that within the capability of your you as a shooter and your weapon system, you're going to have some, some variation, and this can predict it and keep you from chasing your tail. That's right. And you can do the same thing horizontally. So I just built highs and lows. You could build a left and a right file as well. And when you go into there, you just tell your, um, instead of your impact height, your impact windage, you would give it the left and right limits of your group size for that number. And what that kind of gives you a good idea of is how much of your left-right misses are due to wind or maybe just the group size capability of your system. And, and that's a big one because... Every time we miss left or right, we attribute it to the wind, yeah. and we can't measure the wind good enough, and so it's just, there's nothing we can do about it, yeah. right? Well, it may be the case that your load has enough horizontal dispersion to it from the get-go, from a baseline, that is the wind messing with stuff? Oh, certainly. Yeah. But, but you're already dealing with this. Yeah, you, you know? might have bigger dispersion than you think because, again, a lot of people like to shoot five or ten shot groups and say that they have a quarter-minute rifle, right. when in reality... Uh, it's just, just not the case. You're hiding behind small sample size and not necessarily maliciously hiding, but right. you're, you're trusting noisy data that yep. out of, uh, infinite, a, a number of possibilities you captured five that, that shot a quarter inch. Right. 
interesting. Man, this has been, even for me, uh, there's a lot that I learned here. That high-low thing is super handy. The mm-hmm. lock screen with your range card on there, just phenomenal. Cool. Um, I would encourage all the listeners uh, to jump on the YouTube and watch this thing uh, because that's going to be a lot more helpful, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you haven't already, it's a free app. Download that sucker and, and run it side by side. And see for yourself, you know, it's like, we're not trying to force this on anybody. It's mm-hmm. literally free. Come see the light. And uh, it, it's, it's warm in the sun. It feels pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously biased to the program. I've had a, a pretty hefty hand in its design and creation. Mm-hmm. Um, so if there's something wrong, let me know. I'm likely responsible for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I actually, I am responsible yeah, for it. I not can... likely. Like, nope. There's no other fingers to point. Uh. Um, but if you have feedback for us, if you would like a certain feature or, hey, it'd be cool if it did this or that, let us know, you know, the comments or the emails or however you can get a hold of us. Um, this thing is a, a living project. We're constantly adding new things to it and updating it and trying to make it as, as good as possible. Yep. Uh, and same thing on the bullet library front. You know, if there's a bullet that's not in the library that you want, reach out to us. Um, again, I think we mentioned on the last podcast most of the competitor bullets that are in there, we source from stores. Midway USA, right? Cabela's. Yeah, yeah. And, and in the last couple of years of, of availability being tough for everybody, uh, that applied to us with this too. So um, we have done it before where a guy said, hey, I'm willing to send you, you know, 50 bullets. If you can get that added into the library for me, that'd be great. We'll, we'll do that sort of stuff. Yeah, so. that's awesome. And like you mentioned, the comments, keep them coming. We've seen a, a pretty big influx of comments regarding the podcast here in the last couple of months, and that's great. Not only just like, hey, we like listening to the show, keep it up, uh, or hey, I, you know, I shot this really awesome buck or whatever, but also suggestions that people want to hear about shows and topics and mm-hmm. in this vein, yeah, if you've got certain bullets or certain features, drop a comment on the YouTube video or send us an email at podcast at hornady.com. We do enjoy hearing from you guys, even if when it's uh, being critical, you know, if, because there, if there are ways that we can improve, we certainly want to. Yeah, if there's something wrong, please let us know. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't want the the bad feedback not to come because sometimes we don't know there's a problem because there's a couple of us users here, but there's hundreds of thousands of people that use this app. And so the chance of somebody else catching something wrong yeah. uh, versus us is, is there. Yep. So. Awesome. Well, I think that's, that's probably long enough in this particular Ford off podcast. There's more features um, that we didn't talk about. We didn't, you know, even get into the ballistic uh, BC calculator. Mm-hmm. Um, but gosh, I think for a new user or even a current user, they're going to pull a bunch of cool information from this podcast. So, Jaden, this installment of Quinlan's Corner was just <laughs> just epic. You had to get that in at the end, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Preston, thanks for coining that one. But anything you want to leave the listeners with? Um, no. Hey, thanks for listening. Thanks for the comments and the feedback. It that interaction helps. You know, like you said, this definitely isn't my primary duty here. No. Um, so, so being able to run up here and, and get some good information out that's helping people is really cool. Awesome. Well, we, we thank you. We'll let you get back to the lab and doing all kind of the ballistic development group stuff. And ladies and gentlemen, we will catch you on the next one.